I'm in the temple just for a few months. I'm enjoying myself. I have attachments still outside. I, I have a young, a, a young child, a new baby. <laughs> but um, the pool of Krishna consciousness is strong enough for me to... to and my partner wasn't ready for living in a, mon a monastic situation or in temple. or She wasn't ready for, for Krishna consciousness at all. So we decided amicably to... to so I was there, just turned 20 years of age, having been in the temple for a couple of, a couple of months now, and Srila Prabhupada is finally coming. He's finally on his way, the leader of all this, the one behind all this, that's made me give up my life of pleasure seeking, come all the way to London and change my life for a higher purpose. So he's coming. And I'm excited, and everyone's excited. Prabhupada's coming, Prabhupada's coming. And we're running around. So we're at the door, in the doorway, waiting for Prabhupada to arrive. Uh, along he comes in a vehicle, I forget what kind of vehicle he was in. And he steps out and comes straight into the temple. And the first thing that strikes me is he's a lot smaller than I expected. Not necessarily in stature, but I felt that this man has done so much so far. I was expecting a large warrior, <laughs> I don't know my expectations, but he was small and he smiled and I'd never seen anything like that smile in my life. He had a wide mouth, he was grinning from ear to ear and when he opened his mouth, his teeth and his mouth shone like the sun. It, it was like the sun shining from his mouth. And he looked at us all clearly with love. He loved being with us. And he s swept past us with his servants and the, the others into the temple room. We followed him. He paid his obeisances to Radha Gokulananda, sorry, to Radha Landanishwara. And he came to the back of the temple, climbed up on his Vyasasan, which was quite high up there, but as though he'd done this before. He almost like swanned up onto the Vyasasa and sat down and looked at us all happily, clearly happy to be in our company. His first words were, I'm so happy to be here again with you all in London. And he closed his eyes and opened them again and said, actually, we are not in London. We are in Vaikuntha. Wherever the holy name of Krishna is chanted, that is Vaikuntha. I felt carried away into the clouds with this pronouncement. I felt safe. I felt you've made the right choice. Well, I was living in Hawaii and I was a hippie, but I was looking for God. And Krishna put me with um, Munibunda's mother. I was living there. And I saw a poster on a bakery window and I had my friend take me there, and Prabhupada was the only one there. He answered the door and invited us up. This was in 1969. So we went up, and Prabhupada was sitting there at a desk that was plywood with bricks underneath to hold him up, and he started talking about God. But he was just like the perfect person. He was effulgent, naturally. He was so mild and so friendly and so warm and so kind in his mannerisms that you just fell in love with him. And he was so expert that he answered all of my questions that I'd been accumulating for years and I wasn't even asking him anything. I could see him looking into my mind and into my heart and he was just in the course of his conversation answering everything. The first time I met Prabhupada was in Honolulu, 1972, when Prabhupada came to the temple to visit. And I don't remember very much. Um, 
I was very new to ISKCON and pretty spaced out. But uh, I do remember a couple of points. Well, one in particular. And, and that was that when Prabhupada sat down to chant Jai Radha Madhava, I was just amazed at how spiritually powerful it was. And I just had this feeling like I'm, this is it, I'm blasting off right now. I'm going to the spiritual world right now. I had no, I had no, before that, I had no understanding really of who Prabhupada was. I only knew through the books and through his disciples and through the mantra, but I didn't have any concept of Prabhupada as a person. And there he was in person. It was fantastic. I was a college student at Temple University. In 1967, Prabhupada came to visit my college. And uh, they had a, he had a few devotees with them. And in those days, they used to dance in a circle and chant Hare Krishna. And Prabhupada spoke. I, I was so non-conscious that I don't remember a lot of the things he said, but I did remember that he said, no illicit sex, no gambling, no intoxication, and no meeting. And I was thinking, this is 1967, and this person is preaching no intoxication, no illicit sex in the middle of the university campus. He must have integrity. He must not be looking just for money or followers, but really presenting something genuine because he was going against the current of the material world and what the young students were into. So I, even though I didn't have an intense experience with Prabhupada, I, I always carried that feeling of respect that I had from that first meeting. When I first met, saw Prabhupada, I wasn't a devotee, although I had chanted Hare Krishna and had I'd come in contact with the name, you know, the holy name. And I went to a temple, I was living in France, and I went to a temple in Switzerland, in Geneva, because there were posters, Srila Prabhupada's coming to the temple. Well, it was just a house, actually. And um, I went with a friend, and he said, let's go see the spiritual master. So we went along, we went straight through the house into the back garden, which was quite small. There were very few devotees there, and Prabhupada was doing a fire sacrifice in the garden. And, you know, I was, wasn't a devotee. I was like, Ooh. walked in and he just looked over at me, looked straight into my eyes. I mean, I was like, and I had been on a spiritual search for years looking at this guru and that guru. And he looked at me and I, how to describe it? Like, it was like he had pierced all my material coverings and got to me the soul. And, and that experience was, in one sense, devastating because my ego was, I could, oh, I was kind of filled with shame and oh, I could see all these awful coverings I had of the material energy and it was like, ah, you know, and I just wanted a hole to open up in the ground and disappear. And at the same time, I was just filled with just complete uh, delight and I can't explain it really, just I knew he was my spiritual master and I'd been looking for him. So it was mixed like that. So that was my first time I saw Prabhupada. The next time I saw Prabhupada was uh, after I had been serving in the temple for about six months and was somewhat purified. I, everyone always used to say Prabhupada this, Prabhupada that, and I was worried. When I see Prabhupada, what will I feel? Will I feel anything? And um, so in those days, we used to, in Brooklyn, New York, we used to have two buildings. One was the temple, and one was Prabhupada's quarters. And the word got out, Prabhupada's coming, and we all ran downstairs. You know, the last nail was hammered in, as always, just in time. And Prabhupada got out of the car, and I had never seen anything like it in my life. He, he was um, like he was floating. Um, and uh, I remember him turning around, facing us with folded hands, 
and with a look of humility and love and compassion that I had never seen before in my life. And I just started weeping in the street. And I was realizing this person is not going to cheat me. And, uh, and he didn't. It's my initiation day. I have two initiation stories. The first initiation is when I received my name from Srila Prabhupada. And this, so far as I can remember, would be about five or six weeks after I joined the temple. After five or six weeks, I was sitting before Srila Prabhupada being initiated. I was reluctant at first, but I had a friend, an older devotee, one of the first English devotees, Kula Shekhar was his name. And Kula Shekhar had taken to me, so we were close friends. He liked me a lot, and he was always encouraging me in my service. So there was going to be an initiation ceremony. And he said, Kishore. No, he didn't. <laughs> he said, Pat. <laughs> he said, Pat, you should take initiation. You might not get another opportunity like this. I said, but I've only been around for a month or so. I'm, I'm too, I don't know yet. I'm not quite sure. He said, you should take the opportunity. It might not happen again. And somehow or other, he encouraged me to take initiation. So, however, there I was before Srila Prabhupada, after five or six weeks of having been in the temple, and I'm hoping that Prabhupada doesn't give me a long, complicated name that I can never remember, you know, that the, because there had been a few already, and I was hoping for something simple. And I was bearing in mind my, my godbrother, Ronchur. I, I liked that name, that was simple. It's just two syllables, Ronchur, it sounded sweet and easy to remember. That's all I remember. I just hope that I can remember the name that Prabhupada gives me. So when it comes my, my, my turn, and, and the initiate before me was, a, was a, a, a girl who Prabhupada named Kishori. That was her name, Kishori. And so off she went with her beads, and then it was my turn. And I was praying that I w I'd be able to remember the four regulative principles, because I knew Prabhupada was going to ask me about the four regulative principles. So fortunately, somehow I stumbled through the four regulative principles, and then he gave me my beads and said, and your name is Kishore. And he gave me my beads and he looked in my eyes and said, you know what is the meaning of Kishore? I said, no. <laughs> no. So he looked at me and said, Kishore means adolescent Krishna. When he used to woo the gopis, like that, then but you are not Kishore. <laughs> you are Kishore Das. Ah. And off I went with my smile on my face and my beads, clutching my beads and my name, which I could remember. And Prabhupada had even explained what it meant. I felt so happy and relieved that it was all over. And I'd remembered the four regulative principles. And I was somehow on board. Somehow or other. At the second initiation, here's the other initiation story, it was time, this would be about a year later, about 12 months or so later. Again we're in Berry Place and again Prabhupada is awarding second initiation to some of the devotees and it, I was included in, in, in the group. As it was, we weren't expecting the initiations to come until later in the day. So I'd been doing some service, and I was running around the temple, not necessarily prepared. But somehow something had happened and Prabhupada's schedule changed. And he had to leave to go on some preaching, to, to visit some life member or to go away. So the initiation was brought forward by about half a day. And someone came and said, Kishore, Kishore, it's time, it's time. You have to go now to get your initiation, but I said, but I'm not ready, I, I haven't prepared, I haven't, you know, I think I had time quickly to have a quick shower or maybe even just splash my face and I, I don't even think I had time for, for a shower. So I did my best, put on a fresh dhoti and rushed up the stairs and almost immediately I was ushered into Prabhupada's room, upstairs. Whew, put some tilak on quickly. 
and the room was semi, semi dark. And Prabhupada's servant was massaging, I forget, it might have been Aravinda, possibly Aravinda, I don't know if it was Shruta Kirti, but I think it was Aravinda at the time, can't remember. But it was just Prabhupada in his gumsha with this radiance coming off his body. You can see the oil and the radiance. So I was ushered into the room and Prabhupada was at the other end of the room, the other side of the room. And I stepped inside and Prabhupada immediately looked in my direction and he said, you have bathed today? I'd barely even come into the room. And I said, yes, Prabhupada. I didn't want to go through the whole explanation or whatever. It would have just sounded so... I, I said, yes, Prabhupada. And he looked at me and said, there is odour coming. And I thought, I've blown it. I'll have to wait till some other Prabhupada's going to kick me out. There's odour coming. And he was way at the other end of the room. And he looked at me and said, come. And I sat down. And he said softly, Brahman means clean. Brahman must bathe three times daily. And then rather than say that, he said, come. And then he proceeded to give me Brahman initiation. I was astonished. How is it possible for him to, you know, I just walked in. <laughs> so that was my lesson, that if I want to be Brahman, then you be clean, clean. We went on a Harinam, the first Harinam in Hawaii. And they picked me up in a red truck, and Prabhupada was sitting in the front, old red truck, really old. A red truck with Prabhupada and Govinda Dasi and Gorsindar, and I was in the back. It was like I just met him a few days before. So I jumped in the back and was trying to talk to the different devotees that were there, and they were men, and no one would talk to me. <laughs> so um, I jumped out of the back when we got where we were going. And I wanted to walk with Prabhupada because he was so kind and I really liked him a lot. So I went and I started walking with him. And uh, I had a mini dress on. That's me in the picture with the mini dress on. And Prabhupada had his umbrella. And he was walking, he took a few steps and he put it in the ground and he looked at me. He said, do you not know you are a woman? And then I became very embarrassed with this mini dress and I, actually, I wasn't offended at all. He was so wonderful. I just was learning from him. Everything he said to me had so much knowledge, and that's what I was looking for. And he was able to correct my vision of life, and I was very happy for that. But he was so sweet, too. You know, He was like your best friend that you'd been looking for. But, and you could also tell actually even the first day I met him, that he was a representative of God. It was just very apparent who he was. The very first thing I read that Prabhupada had written was a line in one of his books that said, this world is a world of birth, death, disease, and old age. And my immediate reaction was, finally somebody is telling me the truth. I had experimented with so many things, materialism, LSD, Buddhism, Christianity, so many things, but this nobody had said. Also impersonalism I'd exper experimented with. But nobody had said this and I thought, wow, finally, that's the reality, that's the hard truth. That was really convincing. And then, I got sort of accidentally caught up in a kirtan, at the end of which I had this distinct uh, realization that the body and the soul are different. I had never before in any other way had that experience, had that realization or that perception. And so I was intrigued, to, to say the least. But I was still a little bit skeptical. And I thought, 
if this mantra is really what it seems to be, then there must be a really extensive philosophy behind it. And so I wanted to study the philosophy. But there weren't many books in those days. This was 1971. And besides that, I'd already given all my money to the devotees and they didn't have any money left to buy any books. So there are a lot of other factors involved, but uh, to make it short, I uh, phoned up the temple president. I'd never been to the temple. I just knew known devotees in other situations, but I'd never been to the temple. So I asked if I could come and uh, visit the temple and uh, just to see what it's like. So he had met me before, and he said, sure. I said, I, my idea was just go for a couple weeks, check it out. So the first day I was there, they took me out on Harinam, chanting Hare Krishna in the, in the street. This was in Waikiki, the, it's a really degraded area, all kinds of sinful things going on. But I was so amazed that the devotees, they, we had a place to sit to do Horitam, to chant. And it, it, it seemed to me there was this sort of like transcendental bubble around them that was protecting them from all this. And they were singing so beautifully. And I saw people were stopping. And it seemed like they weren't stopping like just curious, not that kind of stopping. But it seemed like they were like stopping involuntarily, like frozen, just like whole families, you know. Uh, and then I remembered that the devotees had told me that this sound vibration goes straight to the soul. It doesn't have to go through any kind of intellectual or mental layers. It goes straight to the soul. And I thought, wow, I'm, I'm seeing it. That's what's happening. And they had also said, this is the highest welfare work. And for some time I had been wanting to do welfare for humanity, but I didn't know what. I tried, again, I tried different things, but it was not satisfying. But this, I thought, wow, highest welfare work, that's what I want to do. And so I was thinking, okay, this mantra is touching their hearts, touching the soul. And plus they were distributing Back to Godhead magazines, a few devotees were. And so people who are more interested, they get the knowledge, they get the philosophy. And I thought, this is it. This is the highest welfare work. And I decided right then, this is how I want to spend the rest of my life. And when we got back to the temple at 10 o'clock at night, there were a couple of brahmacharis shaving their heads. And they, they asked me if I want to shave my head. And I thought, well, I already had tilak on. I had a dhoti. And I decided this is how I want to spend the rest of my life. So I said, OK. First time I got it, my head shaved. <laughs> Srila Prabhupada has just installed Radha Gokulananda at the Bhaktivedanta Manor. It's August 1973. He's just installed the deities, and the following day is his appearance day. It's called Vyasa Puja. And Prabhupada has just given a lecture, a talk, from the Vyasa Sun, and it's time for questions. The temple room is packed. It's a joyous occasion. We've been waiting for this moment for a couple of years now, since Berry Place in London was overcrowded. We looked for a new place, and with George Harrison's help, we found this beautiful manor. And Prabhupada has just installed the deities, Radha Gokulananda, and the day after, he's sitting on the Vyasa Sun, and we're celebrating his appearance day, Vyasa Puja. And it's time for questions and answers. So there are some questions and answers. I don't necessarily remember the detail, but then the devotee beside me, he puts up his hand and he says, Srila Prabhupada, is it possible for a pure devotee to ever forget Krishna? Prabhupada looks at Radha Gokulananda and closes his eyes like this for a moment. He opens them again and looks at the devotee next to me and says very slowly, every day I pray to Krishna, please 
don't let me fall down. And my heart almost leapt out of me. I still, here's my master. I don't know anything about his stature, really. I'm still a young boy, running around, doing service. And here's my master, my spiritual master. And he is honestly declaring that every day he prays to Krishna, please, don't let me fall down. So I'm thinking, it can happen to anyone. If it can happen to Prabhupada, it can surely happen to me. So I'd better pull my socks up and get serious. After I had been serving about six months, Prabhupada came, I joined in December. Prabhupada came uh, in the summer to perform initiation and my name was submitted. And uh, uh, I didn't know anything. And uh, I wanted, because they usually gave a name that was like the first letter of your name. So I wanted, all I knew, I wanted the name Balaram because I was Bob. And uh, so anyway, one person went after another and the prophet said, what are the four regulations and what else? And then he would hand them their beads. And uh, a lady had just gone before me and she couldn't even speak. She was crying and prophet just went like that and gave her the beads and told her her name. And then it was my turn and uh, I came up and I reached for my beads and Prabhupada pulled them back just like this. And I thought, oh boy, he must see something. something. Something's not right. But then somebody whispered in my ear, right hand. And I said, oh, oh. And I reached for the beads with my right hand and he gave them to me. And my name wasn't Balaram. It was a beautiful name of Virginia Nandana, which I'm so fortunate to have. But at the time, I didn't know anything. And uh, so that's, that's pretty much how the initiation went. So when Prabhupada came one time, to, another time to the manor, um, I, my daughter Rasalila was one and a half years old. And Prabhupada was sitting on his Vyasa sand, and the devotees were gathered around him. And, and uh, I couldn't get near to Prabhupada, uh, you know for different reasons. I mean, was a woman. <laughs> but um, but um, so I would send my daughter on like my emissary, you know. So I gave her a yellow rose because we thought you Prabhupada like yellow rose. And she went up to, she went running up to Prabhupada and gave him the rose. And he, as, he, as he does, he just beamed, he beamed at her and he looked so delighted. And I really got the sense he loved all of us, but he, children, he was, he, he just really connected with them. In, in such a delightful way. But the other interesting thing that, which I just th thought of before, um, was at that time, there was this devotee who I knew very well, and he was a real, ra really a rascal devotee. I mean, he did the most terrible things, dressed as a devotee. He was a devotee, but a bit crazy. And he did things that would have made Prabhupada really angry, I know. And yet, and he got put in prison for some of the stupid things he did. But for some amazing miracle, he got let out of prison and he came to the manor that day, just for the weekend, so he could see Prabhupada. So he was in there, and Prabhupada we know, knows everything about, he knows what's going on. And um, he kept looking at this devotee and smiling and giving him so much mercy, I was just like, whoa, you know, and I, from that I just saw the compassion Srila Prabhupada had for everyone, everyone. He just, he loved him as much as everyone. I was just absolutely, was, you know, I was amazed, amazed. We were at the Bhakti Vedanta Manor in 1973. And I'm in Prabhupada's room, his darshan room, which is upstairs. It's a beautiful big room, large room, and it's packed. And today, so far as I can remember, it's full of people with, from different religious denominations. 
At that time, Shamsunda had been inviting different people to come in and meet with Prabhupada. And today it was the interfaith almost, you know. So leaders of different spiritual denominations, religious denominations, had come to see who is this person, who is this Swami, the leader of this Hare Krishna group. So it was full of devotees and all these people. And Prabhupada was speaking away, explaining Krishna consciousness. And I'm standing somehow or other just next to Prabhupada, possibly because there, there's nowhere else to sit. And I've, I've moved to the only place left, and it happens to be just behind Prabhupada. Now, the door slowly opens, and in walks a little five-year-old boy, Premananda, who happens to be my stepson. I've recently married, and so he's my little stepson. And little Premananda happens to be dressed from head to toe in a sannyasi outfit with a little danda. And I think, what's his mother doing? <laughs> what is she thinking about? And Prabhupada stops speaking and looks over, and his face turns into a, a smile from ear to ear. He says, Maharaj, like this, and his eyes open wide like this. He says, Welcome, come. So little Premananda, somehow or other, he starts to clamber over all the people sitting in the room. He can't, he's just literally climbing over people to come forward to sit before Srila Prabhupada, who's at his table. And Prabhupada's just beaming at him, as though here comes the sannyasi from his travels, he's returned. And so he sits before Prabhupada, and Prabhupada's just smiling and addressing him, Maharaj, what is your name? Premananda, Premananda Maharaj. He says, take, and he offers him a sweet from his, there's a tray of sweet balls on the table. And so Premananda, he's sitting there, he puts one, and Prabhupada's just enjoying watching him, eating the sweet and the sannyasi with the danda. I think he took another one, a second one as well, and Prabhupada's just enjoying seeing Premananda. And then he continues to address. Now the first thing I remember about all this is that when Prabhupada saw Premananda, his whole countenance changed. He was serious and stern one moment, and when Premananda walked into the room, Prabhupada almost became as a child, as Premananda. It was like two children for the mo in the moment. I could literally see a change. Prabhupada transformed into a child and then again transformed into the spiritual master and continued explaining to his audience about Krishna consciousness. And Premananda just sat there for the rest of the... And Srila Prabhupada was finished with him now and he was back to being serious and preaching Krishna consciousness. Now, that's almost the first part of this story because part two of this particular story is, comes the next morning. The next morning, downstairs during the morning program. And Prabhupada's on his morning walk. And I'm downstairs keeping my eye on Premananda, who by this time is behaving a little bit differently. Now he's running around playing with his friends and charging around, using his danda as a weapon and beating people with it and chasing around. And the kids are having a great time. I look around and there is Srila Prabhupada standing in the corner, looking at this scene, not looking happy. He's very grave indeed. And I can feel it, my heart goes, <clears throat> And he says quietly to the person next to him, who is the father? Oh. oh. So I walk forward. I'm the father, Srila Prabhupada. So I'm standing right before Srila Prabhupada like this, and he looks right into my eyes, and he's very grave and very serious. And he says, he shouldn't dress like this anymore. Sannyas 
is very serious business. And he walks off, that's all. He wasn't having any fun with Premananda this time at all. And I thought, what a difference from one evening to this morning. Same boy, same spiritual master, different message. It was profound, that one. I was learning that this man, this person is unpredictable. I have no idea how he's going to be from moment to moment, and yet, like no one I'd ever seen before or met before, had this, like a chameleon, able to change according to the circumstances. He had a very profound message to deliver, and he wanted me to be very aware of that. I wasn't particularly aspiring to become a sannyasi. It was, hadn't even entered my mind. But at the same time, the message was that sannyas is very serious business. He told me so. But Prabhupada was unpredictable, I found. That's why I loved him so much. I didn't know what to expect. In the early 70s in ISKCON, there was what was called the Library Party. Uh, it was a special, you could say, elite party of just a few devotees whose remit was to go to professors and librarians and try to s sell standing orders of Prabhupada's books. Standing order meant that they were buying all the books that Prabhupada had already published, plus all the books that he would publish in the future. Uh, and if we couldn't sell standing orders, then we could sell a set of Chaitanya Charitamrita, a set of Bhagavatams, or individual Gitas, or whatever. So, uh, Satsuru Maharaj very mercifully invited me to join this party uh, at Rathayatra 1974 in San Francisco, uh, San Francisco when Srila Prabhupada was there. And uh, later, so then we traveled around the United States. And in early 75, we were in the South, uh, American South. And I uh, met a a history professor. We would go into the uh, library of each school and we would select from the course catalog the professors that we thought could be suitable for what we had to do. So this lady was a professor of Southeast Asia. So one of our standard lines was that the culture of Southeast Asia, much of it, it comes from India. So that's one of the things I told her. And she said, well, that's not the modern thinking now. And I said, what do you mean that's not the modern thinking? I said, you're a history professor, right? <laughs> Isn't a history professor concerned with facts, with what happened, right? And she said, no. She said, in every period of time, there is some particular professor, professor, prominent professor, he's prominent in the field, and his way of thinking about the situation, that's what everybody else follows. And she said, we're not interested, we're not concerned with facts. And that really stuck in my mind. I just, I, I was just amazed. I don't think she took a book, I don't remember, but maybe. Anyway, a few weeks later, uh, I was in Atlanta with the rest of the library party, so this was what, March or uh, February or March, uh, 1975, and uh, Prabhupada was there. There were a few hundred devotees there from all over the United States, especially the East. And uh, Satsuru March, of course, he had influence because he was a GBC and a sannyasi, and uh, he arranged for us to be able to go on one of the morning walks. Not just anybody could go on a morning walk. It was mostly, it was 
GBC members, sannyasis, uh, temple presidents, people that were prominent. But he worked it out that one day we got to go on the morning walk. So I don't remember which members of the library party were on the walk. Satsuk Marge, of course, was there. Uh, but I do remember Ganesham Prabhu and Mahabudi Prabhu and me. At least the three of us were there. And somehow or other, Ganesham Prabhu, almost right at the beginning, got into a dialogue with Prabhupada. Now, even at that early stage, Ganesham Prabhu had started becoming sort of prominent in ISKCON. So he was not exactly a big shot yet, but he was going in that direction. Anyhow, everybody knew him. And he got into this dialogue with Srila Prabhupada, and I'm listening to it, and I'm just burning with envy. And I'm thinking, okay, Ganesham Prabhu is the biggest distributor on our party. Fine, I understand that. Oh, then Mahabudi Prabhu also chimed in a couple of things. Okay, and he's the second biggest distributor. I understand that. But I'm also going out every day distributing Prabhupada's books to professors and librarians. And I also want to have a dialogue with Prabhupada. <laughs> so I don't remember, you know, my envy was so great that I don't even remember what Prabhupada was saying. I don't remember the topic or anything. I was just thinking, I want to get into this dialogue. I want to be involved. <laughs> so then at one point, Srila Prabhupada said, we simply have to give them the facts. And it just rang a bell in my brain uh, from my experience with that lady, with the, with the historian, that she said they don't care for facts. So without even thinking about what I was doing, just really spontaneously, I just blurted out, but Srila Prabhupada, they say they don't care for facts. Now, you can hear on Morning Walk, uh, recordings, you can hear Prabhupada's cane. He's going click, click, click. And then all of a sudden, on this occasion, it was click. And Prabhupada stopped short. His eyes were flashing. And he just looked right at me. And he said, then we do not care for you. I must have jumped about a foot in, in the air because Everybody started laughing. There are all these big GBC men and sannyasis and all kinds of big shots. I was a really insignificant person. Nobody knew who I was or anything. And, <laughs> you know, everybody's laughing. I, I thought, this isn't funny. <laughs> My spiritual master just said he doesn't care for me. It took me, I don't know, probably at least 24 hours to understand that Prabhupada wasn't talking about me. He was talking about the professors. <laughs> So, anyway, then I concluded from that experience, maybe better just to let Ganesham Prabhu have the dialogues with Prabhupada. <laughs> so, Srila Prabhupada's coat came about. Govinda Dasi said that Prabhupada shouldn't wear black, neither should he have buttons. So she asked me if I could make a coat for him. And I thought she wanted wool. Now we were in Hawaii, you know, wool in Hawaii, saffron wool in Hawaii. What are the chances? So I went to Sears at Ala Moana Center. And as soon as I walked in the fabric department on a table, there was a bolt of saffron wool, just the perfect color. And so I started getting a pattern. I got a sweatshirt pattern. and. Anyway, I ended up making the coat, and uh, Governor Dasi also had Prabhupada's coat from his business. So I would try Prabhupada's coat on to measure the coat I was making. But, but my realization was that Krishna was taking such nice care of Srila Prabhupada that his disciple wanted to serve him, and he, for appearances, it was better for him to have a saffron coat because of who he was and his position as a sannyasi. So everything just kind of came together. I couldn't find anything for the hood, and so I wandered around the store, and there was a 
toilet bowl cover that was that mustard colored fleece that I used for the hood. <laughs> anyway, actually Prabhupada wrote me a letter and because I told him that I, I would want something and then all of a sudden it would appear. And Prabhupada wrote to me, he said, yes, he said, Krishna takes care of all living entities, but for his devotees he takes specific care. So don't be surprised that Krishna is providing for you specifically. We, we, were, we were called van devotees. We went around all over, distributing from city to city, living in the van, distributing Prabhupada's books. And um, every night we would listen to this tape of Prabhupada singing in 1969 on the disappearance day of his spiritual master in a very, very heartfelt way. Uh, his prayers to the spiritual master and, and a few other things. And, and we would, every night, we'd go to sleep listening to it. And, uh, and then a letter came from Srila Prabhupada. And it was addressed to the, uh, the Sankirtan leaders there. And, and Prabhupada wrote in the letter, I am always thinking of those boys in the vans. So that made it a whole different experience. Every night we'd go to sleep listening to the tape, thinking of Prabhupada and knowing that he was thinking of us. Even in the middle of nowhere, in the middle of America, we'd be sleeping in our van. And uh, the, the, the thing about Prabhupada is that he, he, he had so much um, majesty. He was majestic. And sometimes some of the leaders would present that as the fact that he was heavy. But actually, Shruti Kirti, who was, you've probably interviewed already, uh, he said the thing that he felt most about Prabhupada was that he was the kindest person he ever met. One day I'm, in, I'm, I'm fortunately on a morning walk with Srila Prabhupada and it's at Regent's Park in London. This would be in 71 or 72. And we're in Regent's Park in London and I, I've always held back during the morning walks. I've been at the, the back. Prabhupada's always had sannyasis or older god brothers with him, so I, I've always been happy to stay in the back, out of sight, almost hoping Prabhupada wouldn't even notice me. That's how I felt, you know, I just wanted to stay as far away as possible, and so on and so forth. But before I joined, I had one poster of Krishna. It was a favorite poster of mine, Krishna playing his flute with, in Vrindavan with the river Jamuna, a little waterfall, and underneath the image was the name Murli Manohar. So I always wondered what this meant and none of the devotees had really been able to tell me. So somehow or other I found myself next to Prabhupada. I don't quite know how it happened but there I was and before thinking too much about it I opened my mouth and said, Srila Prabhupada, one of Krishna's names is Murli Manohar. Could you tell us what this means? And he immediately looked at me and smiled like this and closed his eyes and opened them again and said, Murli means flute and Manohar means beautiful. So when Krishna takes his flute, he is even more beautiful. He smiles like this and walks on. And I thought, oh, he liked the question. Oh, and I just felt, oh, I'm even more connected with this movement now. Krishna becomes even more beautiful when he takes his flute. <laughs> oh. One of the qualities of a devotee is that they're clean. And Prabhupada was a super clean person. Actually, probably the cleanest person I've ever met. Um, when he came to Hawaii after we moved to the new temple on Koala Way, they'd set up a beautiful room for Srila Prabhupada that's still there. And they asked me to make cushions. And they gave me this very dark blue fabric. So I stayed up like all night and I made these cushions and the bolsters for the side. And the next day he sent it back to me that he wanted white fabric. He said, if it's 
dark, you can't see that it's dirty, and he wanted to be able to wash it when it got it the least bit dirty. And then also in uh, Davis at Anmandir in Detroit, when Prabhupada, we first moved into the temple, Prabhupada came, it was the uh, Fisher Mansion, and Prabhupada came, and they had put these beautiful carpets out, and they fixed the room up really nice. Uh, the next day, he said he wanted white sheets put over the carpets because that way you can see the dirt and you can take off the cover and wash it and put it back down. This is very, um, not fanatical, but just extremely clean. Such a good example for us. When Prabhupada did come to Honolulu, um, when he was lecturing, I don't remember very much of what he was saying, but what I do remember was that in one lecture, uh, there was a brahmachari there named Ananda Das. Uh, and Prabhupada said something in his lecture about our, we should be grateful for modern technology. And Ananda Das let out this big guffaw, you know, really loud laugh in a relatively small room. And Prabhupada stopped and he said, no, he said, do not laugh. He said, of course we should be thankful for modern technology. Otherwise, how could we spread Krishna consciousness all over the world? That made a big impression on me. I was in his room, because we were a party of devotees that were just about to go out on the road. So they let us come into Prabhupada's room that day. And a few things happened in there. First of all, he was mixing some medicines and Everything he did was so magical. It was like you, you, couldn't, you, you couldn't take your eyes off it. It was so perfect, everything. Every little gesture was full of, um, I don't know, Shakti or, but it was, you know, he's from the spiritual world, so what he's doing is not ordinary. Even a little thing like pouring something into a bottle became an experience to watch. But I remember different things he talked about in the room that day. One devotee asked him, uh, Prabhupada, will you come to Chicago? And Prabhupada, as if he never really heard the question, or which I'm sure he did hear, but he said, are you convinced about the urgent necessity for Krishna consciousness in your life? Only then can you preach. So that was it. Are you convinced of the urgent necessity of Krishna consciousness in your life? Only then can you preach. And it makes sense because unless we're realizing the urgent necessity, how can we realize the urgent necessity for someone else? And then um, someone asked him about selling records. Uh, and he said, don't sell records, sell books. And he said, somehow or other get them to take a book and to utter the word Krishna. And then the last thing I remember in the, in the room that day was um, he, he, somebody asked a question and he responded by saying, uh, he quoted a verse by Rupa Goswami and he said, um, first make them Krishna conscious, then give them the rules and regulations. I later on had took advantage of that when I, I ran a Gurukul in, in the 1990s. And uh, we, with the children, we had that mood. Make it fun, make them enjoy Krishna consciousness, and not impose so many rules and regulations on them that it would, be, uh, it would become averse to Krishna consciousness. It was a very successful school, actually. But, but uh, that principle we applied in it. I'm sitting on the lawn with a group of devotees, and it's 1973 again. Prabhupada spent some time in London at the manor, several months. It was the summertime, and so often he'd go on the lawn and sit with the devotees, chanting japa and just talking. Most of those, most of those occasions I would be busy doing service or sankirtan or whatever, and I didn't really feel that I wanted to just sit with Prabhupada for the sake of sitting with Prabhupada. I had a feeling that he might not approve necessarily. 
and I thought, well, the ones that do get to sit with them, then they're more qualified, or that's their good karma, or whatever, but I didn't. But on one occasion I was on the lawn with Prabhupada, and it was a weekend. Now, just not far away from the manor is an airfield, and people come and just fly their little planes for hobby, their hobbies, they just have their, and those little planes, they make a little noise, you know, you, you can zzzz, you, you hear them. And so this was a summer weekend, so it was busy, and lots of these people were up there with their little planes. So I could see we were listening to Srila Prabhupada speak, but all these little planes were a distraction, they were becoming a distraction. I could see myself in particular, and a few of the other devotees were looking up like this and just almost mouthing, I wish they'd go away, we can't hear properly, we, this and that. And I noticed that Prabhupada picked up on this. Prabhupada was looking around at us all, looking up in the sky at these little planes. And so he, he looked up like this too. And again, he smiled from ear to ear as he watched all these little planes buzzing around. And then he looked around at us and he said, they will be mosquitoes. And that's all he had to say. Then he continued to, to speak. They will be mosquitoes. As though, don't worry about them. Don't be distracted. Focus. They will be mosquitoes. Fascinating. I just remember the Prabhupada was, was very loving and uh, even though we, like he used to joke sometimes about how we Westerners were so uncultured and we're like monkeys, and, but he loved his monkeys <laughs> and uh, he, uh, he put up with so much. Uh, and tolerated so much, even criticism from others in the name of uh, helping his disciples. And, uh, his, I think that was it. His, it was what motivated people who met him only once to be ready to give their life was that they felt his love, that he really cared about them. And like I said, he was our hero. You know, we, that sometimes it's said that uh, about um, great Mahabhagavats that you shouldn't talk so much about their stories, it's their philosophy, their specialities, but actually the stories about Prabhupada were part of his speciality. We weren't so learned philosophically, but it was his charisma, his, his amazing, he was, he was funny, he was um, powerful, but he was also very soft. Once in um, Kennedy Airport, I was there. Uh, everybody was sitting around Prabhupada as he was about to take off. And the temple president, Rupanuga, came in and yelled out, the airport officials about are complaining that there's too much commotion. So all the devotees have to leave. So all the devotees got up and started to leave, including Srila Prabhupada. <laughs> and finally Rupa goes, oh no, 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 not you Prabhupada. But Prabhupada was thinking, I'm a devotee, you know, if they're going to leave, I've got to leave. Um, that was the, a certain side of him that you would see every now and then, very childlike, very sweet. Uh, and he had to be everything, because he was all we had. Like I said, in the beginning we didn't have all the books. But we had Prabhupada, and uh, he captured us completely. Another thing is that in that particular temple, the temple president um, didn't believe in buying boga, which is a whole other story, but in particular, no milk. And I was really attached to milk and milk products and I was really suffering separation and I was thinking about it like all day every day about how I just wanted some cream cheese or something. And then 
in the middle of the lecture, I don't remember what the verse was, I don't remember anything except I, what I do remember is that in the middle of the lecture, Srila Prabhupada started talking about the glories of milk products. And my ears really perked up. And I thought, wow, this is amazing. This means Prabhupada knows. He knows what's going on here, that we're being, uh, how do you say, deprived of milk products. And he was going on glorifying, glorifying milk products. And I thought, this is great. This is Prabhupada's indirect way of giving a message to the temple president. Apparently the temple president didn't get that message because <laughs> nothing changed. <laughs> uh, once in Mayapur, he was speaking, I think it was 1975, and he said, all of you have come from so many places all over the world, so many lakhs of dollars have been spent. This is all the mercy of Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, and then Prabhu went like this. And we were all, you know, you could hear a pin drop for about two minutes. We didn't know how to react, what to do, because this is our spiritual master, and we know he wasn't sleeping, and we weren't familiar with the ecstatic symptoms of, of devotees, and, and so Prabhu was there like that for a short time, and then one devotee had the presence of mind to sing Nama Om Vishnu Padaya Prabhu, Hare Krishna, he came out and later on they asked him about it and he was very shy about, the, about it. I'm sitting in Srila Prabhupada's room in Berry Place. It's a very small room on the first floor and again it's packed out with various people, visitors, devotees, standing room only and Prabhupada sitting speaking behind his desk. And then just below the window, outside, comes the sound of a pair of cartels clashing onto the pavement, onto the sidewalk. There's a little group of devotees, they're preparing to go chanting, a chanting party. And one of them drops the cartels. So Prabhupada stops speaking looks towards where the noise is coming from and rises up from behind his desk. He walks over to the window and looks out the window to see the devotees getting ready to go on Sankirtan. And he comes back and sits down and looks at us all lovingly and just says, Lord Chaitanya will personally protect them. And again, I had that feeling that I'm in the right place. Actually, it was Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. He said, Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu will personally protect them. I don't know if you want me to... I think it's important that that thing... It was the whole Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu will personally protect them. But it, it just looked so affectionate. It was the affection with, with which Prabhupada said it. I just felt, yes, I think that's what nailed it for me, was feeling loved. Because I don't really, I hadn't really felt that up until Prabhupada came into my life. I felt loved no matter what. I was a nonsense, but you're loved and I want you here. Yeah. The, the best day of every year was the day that we could glorify Prabhupada. I remember in 1976 we were, I was with this god brother um, Garanga. He's like a demigod. And we were standing in the parking lot waiting for the for the cars to start emptying out and come in and we were going to distribute books. And I said, you know Garanga, one day people are going to be asking us what was it like when Srila Prabhupada was here. And sure enough, People are asking, what was it like? It was a very special time. It was, um, like I said, Prabhupada was our hero. And we would do anything. In our vans, we'd bathe in the snow. We'd go in the subways and make announcements, things I wouldn't even dream of doing now. Uh, we used to go out in the subway cars, and every time the train would stop, we'd make an announcement and then go around and give out little books and collect. And it wasn't easy to deal with your mind and 
senses and then go out and approach people all day, ask, trying to get them to, to distribute a book. I, in my book distribution, I was very fortunate. I, I, I used to distribute on the, on the basis of something I would read in the book that I thought people could relate to, because I wanted them to hear Prabhupada's words. But I found this one picture in the Bhagavad Gita of the five horses running wild in the senses. I sold so many books based on that picture. I would say to people, these are the senses, and the reins is the mind, the driver is the intelligence, and he's lost control. Just like in your own life, you see and going on like that. I say the, the, the person in the back is the soul. And when the soul becomes awakened, it, the intelligence controls the senses. And so Prabhupada said the pictures would sell the books. And sure enough, that so many books went out just based on that picture. I also would go around college dorms. We'd sneak around in the dormitories selling Krishna books. And I would read something. I'd say, just listen to this. And I, said, when, and I still remember what I would read. When Krishna walked on the bank of the Yamuna, he was seen nicely decorated with tilak on his head. He was garlanded with different kinds of forest flowers, and his body was smeared by the pulp of sandalwood and tulsi leaves. Being pleased by the humming sound of the bees, Krishna would play his flute. And together the... the anyway, it went on like that, but it, it, it was so sweet that people bought books based on hearing that passage from the Krishna book. So it was a, it was a very sweet time to be able to distribute books on the basis of the books. That's what Prabhupada really asked us to do. He said, he said, uh, lie to some and not to others, how will that help you become Brahminical? He said, there is sufficient merit in our books that if you simply describe them sincerely to anyone, they will purchase. He said, that art you must develop, not the art of lying. We're in Berry Place Temple. Prabhupada's just given a lecture and it's packed. Berry Place Temple room was small. Relatively speaking, it was small. Shamsundar had made a magnificent job of building it into something that was otherworldly. The temple room in Berry Place was just otherworldly, but it was small. And when it was packed, the condensation would drip from the ceiling and so forth. <clears throat> Prabhupada had just finished his talk and said, are there any questions? And immediately an Indian lady who visited quite frequently to do service. She was, an, she was a frequent visitor, but she was an individual at the same time. She kept herself to herself and was quite argumentative with devotees, strangely enough. She liked being there, but she was a very argumentative. So Prabhupada said, question, are there any questions? And she stood up immediately and said, Swami, can you see God? It was quite challenging, and I thought, mm. And Prabhupada said immediately, yes, you cannot. Then he looked around like this, Krishna is everywhere. Why you cannot see? And Prabhupada didn't need to say anything else. For me, I realized everything in that moment for me. That Krishna, he's everywhere, so if I can't see him, i got to start working. i got to do something. He's everywhere. So he said, why you cannot see? And there was silence, and she was still standing, and Prabhupada was staring. Not staring like this, but gazing affectionately. Why you cannot see? And she didn't know what to say. Silence. More silence. And they're just looking at each other. So then Prabhupada says, Do you want to see? And the silence again. Then she looks down at her feet and shakes her head like this. Then Prabhupada says loudly, Therefore you cannot see. And if you said anything else, I can't remember. I was just stunned at how he dealt with this situation. At first it was a challenge. Swami, can you see God? 
immediately, yes, you cannot. Krishna is everywhere. Why, you cannot see. And then, do you want to see? No. Therefore you, and I always saw the lightning come out, the, or whatever energy it was, come out of his finger when he said that to this lady. And she almost crumbled onto the floor. She took a pranams like this. She didn't want to ask anything else. She'd heard what Prabhupada had, she'd heard what she needed to hear from Prabhupada, so she sat down. Like I say, if there's anything else after that, Prabhupada may have said more, I don't remember. I had what I had got from that. It was unbelievable. Massive experience. Prabhupada could say more in one word or in a couple of words than you could read in a book of philosophy sometimes. That was another thing that took me about Prabhupada. His way with words, his expertise in not misusing one word or using any words unnecessarily to get his point across. And sometimes, as with that lady, even he used the silence to speak volumes because there were big pauses between Krishna's everywhere. Why, you cannot see. Nothing. Silence. Silence. It was remarkable. I'd never seen anyone like this before, and of course never, ever will again. <laughs> so I'm glad that I remembered that one, because that's usually, if people say, can you tell us some Prabhupada memories? Usually that's the one I start with. That, and the way that lady was humbled. So... Prabhupada was once explaining that um, Krishna doesn't need our offerings, fruits and flowers and boga. What he wants is our feelings. And then Prabhupada recited some words, and while he said it, he started weeping. He said, I, I am most fallen and rotten, but I have brought these things for you. Please accept. And they just started weeping and weeping, teaching us the proper mood of worship, the ideal mood of worship. The year is 1972, and we are in a hall in Glasgow, in Scotland, which is where I was born. The place I left when I was 17 because it was so heavy, it was rough, it was violent. I'm sure it had other qualities as well, of course, but as a little child, adolescent, early teenage kid, I wanted to get away from that place. I didn't enjoy my life in Glasgow as a child. Shortly after becoming a devotee and joining the Hare Krishna movement, Prabhupada's mission, we managed to organize a program for Prabhupada to speak at. He came very briefly to Scotland for two days he came to Edinburgh, spent the night in Edinburgh, and the next day, and then in the afternoon, he came over to Glasgow. We'd hired a big hall, and it was pretty full. It was a good turnout. We'd hired the hall in Mary Hill in Glasgow, which is well known as one of the roughest parts of what was then a very rough city. The reason we'd hired the hall there was, though, is there was a big Asian community in that part of Glasgow and also there was a university. So we thought that could bring a lot of, a big audience, hopefully a big audience of students, youngsters and also Asians, Indian bodied audience. And we were right, it was, it was a good turnout and uh, a couple of things happened which I'll never forget. Apart from the fact that Prabhupada gave a very solid talk on Bhagavad Gita, he spoke about fighting, he spoke about warfare, and he spoke about duty. I had my apprehensions. I thought, people here have had enough of all that. <laughs> 
maybe he could have, maybe he could be speaking more flowery, more like like the the peace and love Swami, the <laughs> sweetness and light. But no, Prabhupada gave a very forceful lecture, which was very well received. Contrary to what I was thinking, it was very well received, and the audience were applauding heartily, and it came to questions and answers. Prabhupada answered a few. There were a few questions and answers, and what I remember is that then came this hippie character, long-haired, with a bearded, and he didn't sound very happy at all. And he was raving away from the back of the hall, shouting, whatever, we couldn't really understand. And Prabhupada looked to his servant, or his assistant, whoever he was, and he said, I cannot hear. Can you ask him to come forward? So whoever it was, Ribadanandan Swami, I think, possibly, invited who, this person to come down to the front so that he could express himself and what he wanted to say to Prabhupada. So he came all the way from the back of the hall, all the time just ranting and shouting, you're not God, or we're all God, or you're... I'm God. You were, why should I surrender to someone if I'm already God? Or whatever it was, whether he was stoned or drunk or if it was just the way he was, he wasn't very happy. And he was right down below the stage, continuing to give off all this tirade as it's done. And Prabhupada just sat there listening, quietly. And eventually he finished. And Prabhupada said, so? You're finished now? And he looked at Prabhupada and said, Yes. And so there was silence. And then Prabhupada said into the microphone, pretty quietly, but everyone could hear, he said, You are not God, you are dog. <laughs> and everyone began to cheer and applaud. It was relief. Almost like Prabhupada had switched a, a relief valve. There was tension and now there was relief. But that wasn't all. Prabhupada kindly engaged with him in some exchange. He then went on to ask him, do you know what is God? And the guy said, I think so, sometimes. He said, yes. He said, God, Prabhupada said, God means controller. Are you controller? And he looked at Prabhupada and said, well, sometimes. And Prabhupada said, yes, sometimes. In the office, you are controller. At home, you are controlled. But God is always controller. When you come across that person who is in absolute control, that is God. So he gave this person some time and some understanding. Then he just turned around and walked all the way back to the back of the hall. He seemed satisfied and the audience was applauding. So whether he felt embarrassed or whether, well, I've had said my piece and I've had my response. It was the way Prabhupada handled that though that I thought was just incredible. First of all, he said, you're not God, you're dog. So that could have been just a dismissal. But then Prabhupada explained to him what God meant. At that same venue, when the questions and answers were over, Prabhupada said, Kirtan. So the devotees, led by Rabbanandan, had a big kirtan on the stage. And so everyone was dancing, chanting, and they opened all the doors to the hall. So in from the streets came a lot of these little street kids. Because remember, we're in a real rough part of Glasgow. And so some real rough little kids, raggedy clothes and looking to cause some trouble, came in to find out what was going on in this place after the doors opened. And some of them made their way down to the stage and some of them began to chant like this. You know, making some fun, having a laugh with the, with the weird Hare Krishnas like this. And so 
Some of the devotees, myself included, thought it would be best to get these guys off the stage. They're being offensive or something. We can't have these kids on this stage. They don't know what this is all about. So Rabadana, again, I was behind Prabhupada. Somehow I was just, because I just liked being as close to Prabhupada as I could get, which wasn't very often. So I was just, so Rabadananda, he came up to Prabhupada and said, Prabhupada, should we get these children off the stage? Prabhupada said, no, let them dance. They are devotees. And again, my heart went into my mouth because I thought, it's the way he said it. I thought, Prabhupada sees devotees. And we see a bunch of kids we want to kick off the stage and get them back out the door where they came from. Prabhupada saw devotees. I felt that. I didn't understand it, but I thought, that's how he sees. They're devotees. And he was quite firm. No, he said, let them dance. They are devotees. So I felt happy that I'd brought Prabhupada to this place that I'd left also. I was quite proud and honoured. I felt I was giving something back to that town of my birth. So giving something back. Here's a pure devotee of Krishna in return for what I got from you. You have a pure devotee of Krishna and get his mercy. So Prabhupada was very well received that day. It was very successful. Prabhupada was so happy. I think we only had, we only had little bits in, of, of orange, oranges to give out as, as proof. We had no money, really. We were very poor. So no one had certainly been able to come up with any feast. So we gave out slices of orange to everyone as prasadam. And Prabhupada was giving it out by hand to, to, to people also. And I can remember when he left the stage to leave, he rubbed Tribhuvanath's head. It was Tribhuvanath Prabhu who had organized all this. He rubbed him on the head and said, thank you very much for this. So he enjoyed that. And he told me later in a letter, uh, he said that, um, I like that place, Scotland, very much. And presently we're looking for a new temple, which became back to Vedanta Manor. We hadn't. And hopefully when I come back to England, then I will be able to come back to Scotland again. He said, but I could, not I could not bear the cold, even in August. On a morning walk in Brooklyn, New York, he was talking about the challenges he faced in the first year, no disciples. And, and the one devotee said, but you were very determined, Prabhupada. And Prabhupada says, he said, no. He said, this Hare Krishna mantra is very powerful. And I guess that's another thing that I find very, found very moving, is Prabhupada's arrival prayer. If you've, you've heard it, I'm sure. You know, he starts off by saying, my dear Lord Krishna, you're so kind upon this useless soul but I do not know why you brought me here. Now you can do whatever you like with me, but I guess you have some business. Otherwise, why would you bring me to this terrible place? And I, I was a van leader, and I would have all the devotees in the van say the prayer before they would go out. And there's a certain part where it says, I'm just like a puppet in your hands. So you've, if you've brought me here to dance, then make me dance as you like. He signed, I have no knowledge, nor do I have any devotion, but I have a strong faith in the holy name of Krishna. And he signed it, uh, Insignificant Beggar, A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami Prabhupada. So that prayer always inspired me. Uh, Prabhupada was showing us what the proper mood of a preacher is. And it's not just some external thing, but, but that, that ideal preaching mood was contained in that uh, arrival prayer by Srila Prabhupada. He's the ideal preacher and that was his mood and people coming after him had to have the same mood because that's what, it, that's what a preacher's mood is, total dependence on Krishna, just trying to be the instrument and feeling oneself very unworthy and unqualified. When Prabhupada came to Edinburgh, he gave a, a welcome address. He swept up the stairs into the temple room, onto his Vyasasan, and 
there were a lot of people had arrived to find out who is this leader of this still new Hare Krishna movement, certainly new in Scotland. The people of Scotland were quite aghast and shocked by this new movement. They couldn't figure it out, they couldn't quite make out. It's a very Presbyterian and religious country with a lot of Christian history behind it. At the same time, there were a lot of different Eastern groups springing up. Uh, Transcendental Meditation, the Guru Maharajji. Now, the Guru Maharajji, the Divine Light Mission, had their ashram across the road. And they had a big poster of their, their Guru, the, the Guru Maharajji, staring at us just across the street. It was funny, kind of a little competition going on there. But I, I noticed that a lot of their followers had come up across the road to hear Prabhupada speak. And I also noticed that most of them brought something to offer, a piece of fruit or pints of milk or some, just something to put next to the altar, out of respect. So Prabhupada spoke and then at the end of his address said, are there any questions? And one of the the premies, I think they're called, the followers of, of the Guru Maharaj, he put his hand up and he said, Swami, why must God be philosophy? And Prabhupada looked straight back at him and said, very quietly, Krishna is God and God is great. Philosophy means to know how God is great. And that's all. He said it slowly, clearly, and the person who asked the question, he was happy, he played his pranams and sat down again. But I felt that it was like a thunderbolt, and yet very quiet and clear. Because their philosophy is that if you do something, you go into the light, some mechanical way of just disappearing into some light, becoming one. So he wanted to know, why must God be philosophy? It was a little bit aggressive, but Prabhupada silenced him and he was happy. One other time in Edinburgh, again, Prabhupada was just preparing to leave for Glasgow, for his talk in Glasgow. But I think it was Sham Sunda Prabhu had organized a little press conference. So there were a few journalists that arrived to interview Prabhupada. Not very many, maybe five or six. And it seemed to me that they weren't all that interested. As though these journalists had been, they'd, they'd, they'd drawn the short straw of their newspaper had just sent them along to this temple to interview the Swami, their leader, whoever that he was. It doesn't look as though they were all that interested, but they came with their notebooks and pens and pencils and all that, and they sat around this little makeshift table that we'd put together, you know, hastily. And Prabhupada sat at the top of the table, and these journalists all sat looking at Prabhupada and looking at each other, and they didn't seem to know what to say. So it was very silent for a press conference. They asked questions about what's this on your forehead and so on and so forth. In fact, one of them asked a question that Prabhupada said, what newspaper are you from? And he said, from the observer. And Prabhupada said, so why haven't you observed? Why don't you know these things? in response to the silly, the obvious questions, the shaved heads, the tila, that was his. So Prabhupada started making the conversation rather than the journalists using the time to find out about this. Prabhupada said, so, this Edinburgh is called Festival City. Every year, thousands of tourists. Yes, yes, Swami. And you have two universities, not only one, but two universities, a very prestigious city you have. Yes, yes. And so he's got them softening them up, sweetening them up almost. But they were still not engaging. So then Prabhupada dropped the bombshell. He said, so, why your children are all becoming hippies? 
and taking LSD. <laughs> and this was like a bombshell because they didn't know what to say to this comment. The last thing they were expecting from this peaceful guru type Swami figure. And one or two of them got up and left. They were affronted. They, were in, they felt, oh, how can you speak like this? And the press conference didn't last all that much longer. There were a few small inquiries, questions, as though it's, that was what they were meant to be doing. But they didn't show enough interest. And they were from the, the, the lower end of the newspaper world, the, the tabloid, the sun, the mirror, the daily record, not the, the broadsheets or the higher class paper. So, um, yeah. So I, it, was to, I, it, it shocked me when he said that about the children. Why are your children becoming hippies and taking a list? You've got such a nice city here, everything, two universities, all these tourists. He also commented that these people, they're very proud of their buildings, <laughs> the people of Edinburgh. From a morning walk, he came back from a morning walk, because it is a very beautiful city, if you've been to Edinburgh. It's a very beautiful, beautiful uh, Georgian and, and buildings and so forth. So the last time Srila Prabhupada came to, in 1977 to the manor, he was very, very ill and he would come, come down in a palanquin and just, he'd just sit there, he, couldn't sp he didn't speak, he, he probably couldn't speak, he didn't speak. And we would just, every morning he would come down for weeks and we'd just watch him. And so many devotees around me told, we discussed it, how they had had a certain thought or a question or a prayer and Prabhupada answered it within their heart. But he never spoke. It was just, he would sit there and just, it was almost like he was giving a last message to all his disciples. It was really, really powerful. Mm. Then after that, when Prabhupada was leaving for the airport, I was really fortunate to jump in a van with some devotees, with my daughter, and get to the airport because Prabhupada was leaving, which I hadn't experienced that before at the airport. Anyway, we. I was there again with my daughter, Rasalila, and Prabhupada was in a wheelchair and he was being wheeled towards the departure gate, you know, small thing in those days. And so I sent again my emissary, Rasalila went with a yellow rose and she went running up. And, but the, the point about this is that the whole time he was so grave and serious. So that's the, the thing with this was when she took him the yellow, she ran with him the yellow rose, he took it and he beamed that huge oceanic smile, just like suddenly there was this huge smile that we hadn't seen for weeks. And, and I just, I knew that was the last time I was going to see Srila Prabhupada. It was so clear and it was the, just the most amazing vision to hold that wonderful smile. In 1977, of course, Srila Prabhupada was uh, physically extremely ill and getting worse and worse and worse, and it was becoming more and more apparent that probably he was going to be leaving his body. And so devotees, a lot of devotees, were going to Vrindavan to be with Prabhupada. And I went, I went with two other devotees from America. We arrived in Vrindavan at Krishna Balaram Mandir in the middle of the night, I don't remember what time, one o'clock or two o'clock or something, I don't know. And uh, we met, went immediately to Prabhupada's room. It was dark, it was very quiet, there was nobody there. Uh, and, but we just walked in very quietly. The only person who was there was Bhavananda Maharaj. He was attending to Prabhupada's needs. And he just motioned for us to come in and sit down quietly. So we did that, we sat, not too near the bed, but maybe a meter away or something. And then, and Prabhupada, of course this was before the internet, so we didn't get to see so many photographs very quickly, but we did understand that Prabhupada was uh, emaciated, incapacitated. We'd seen photos from London, from his visit to London. And um, so Prabhupada was lying on his back, apparently asleep. And then Bhavananda Maharaj said, Srila Prabhupada, he said very quietly, Srila Prabhupada, 
these boys have come all the way from America just to be with you. And Srila Prabhupada turned his head just slightly toward us and he said, oh, thank you very much. How are you? Now the three of us were more or less 30 years old and relatively healthy and we just, we were really embarrassed. We just looked at each other like, you know, how are we? You know, Srila Prabhupada, how are you? We didn't say anything because we just it felt so awkward, but that's the way we felt. And uh, it was just another illustration of how humble Srila Prabhupada was and how much he cared for other living entities, even in his own very difficult circumstances. I was always astonished at how relaxed Prabhupada seemed. No matter where he was, I can remember him even lecturing in a big hall, again in London, and he was relaxed. Wherever he was, my one of my major experiences of Srila Prabhupada was that he was unfazed, relaxed, absolutely knew that Krishna was guiding him at all, every moment. What he put up with, I mean, he was an eternal resident of the spiritual world. And he came and lived amongst the most fallen people in the Lower East Side of New York, uh, in, in cooking for them, cleaning up after them, until gradually some devotees started coming forward and just doing service. But his, his willingness to be in a situation with uh, uncultured, uh, but sincere, uncultured, uh, low-class low, low, low people, and love them, and uh, get them to love him. It was only because of his compassion. And very few people could have done what he did. I think one of the, the most outstanding qualities for me right from the beginning was the, was the fact that he had absolutely no false ego at all. None. I'd never met anyone like that. Probably never will, but yet there was no ego at all. And that was probably the main thing. And then there was just, I mean, he was like a father. He was a, he was a spiritual father, but he was so like a father. and. We just felt we couldn't live without him, really. He was, his, mm. his compassion, his caring his, for the devotees, just all those qualities of the pure devotee, so many. As I recall, at the time, the thing that I found most compelling was that Srila Prabhupada was a revolutionary. He was making a real revolution. This was, you know, I, I came of age in the 60s, right? Revolutionary time in America. But I tried the, the Timothy Leary revolution and I didn't last very long with that, a couple of years maximum. And somehow or other, I just never got into the political revolution. The, students for a democratic society and that kind of thing. It just never attracted me. Burning buildings and stuff it wasn't my thing. But this was a real revolution. And this was definitely what I was looking for. Prabhupada was a revolutionary. So I think if I had to pick one of the 26 qualities of a devotee, I would pick mercy. Prabhupada was so merciful that he came, and, and now I'm older, I'm almost 70, and Prabhupada started his journey west at that age. And it's hard to imagine to come to New York City with no money at that age. What compassion and what mercy and what kindness he had to have. A pure devotee's mercy is just so deep, and Prabhupada showed in everything he did, his desire for building temples, his desire for distributing books, 
it was so far from selfish. It was so selfless, everything he did. It was for Krishna's pleasure and out of the kindness of his own heart, his compassion for the suffering of all these living entities. What a great impact he's had on the world because of his compassion and mercy. We're so fortunate <laughs> to become the servant of the servant. <laughs> that means Krishna must be the most merciful because Prabhupada is a beautiful reflection of Krishna. Jai Prachur